You think you know the thing? Well, here's 10 things that you may not have known about one of John Carpenter's greatest films. I just cannot believe any of this voodoo bullshit. Charles, happens all the time, man. They're falling out of the skies like flies. John Carpenter's 1982 science fiction horror film, The Thing, was based on a novella written in 1938 by John W. Campbell titled Who Goes There? It is the third of four movies to be based on the source material. The first being the 1951 film The Thing from Another World. The second film, while only loosely based on the novella, was released in 1972 and titled The Horror Expressed and starred Christopher Lee. The fourth film, released in 2011, was also titled The Thing and is primarily inspired by Carpenter's work and acts as a prequel to his interpretation. Carpenter was very careful in not remaking The Thing from Another World, as he deeply loved and respected it, though he directly references it in his own film. The room in which the alien is held, suspended in a block of ice, is nearly identical to the preceding film. Similarly, the opening helicopter chase sequence pays homage to its predecessor. Even the film's logo is a direct reference to the 1951 film, as they are identical. I want to come back inside, don't you understand it? I'm all right, I'm much better, and I won't harm anybody. And you've got to let me come back inside. The thing hit theaters two weeks after E.T. did. The juxtaposition of a friendly alien starring in a film with a happy ending against a malevolent alien lurking in a narrative with an ambiguous ending did not sit well with audiences. It also opened the same day as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which sat at number two in its first week at the box office. Because of this, The Thing opened at number eight and remained in the box office top 10 for three weeks. Domestically, the film made just shy of $20 million. Overall, it was received rather poorly, garnering tepid reviews despite being noted for the technical brilliance of its practical effects. Carpenter seemed to avoid publicly discussing the film's reception, though has offered a brief glimpse into his feelings on the matter. Quote, I have never understood that stuff. I understand the thing because it was really grim. That was about the end of everything and nobody wants to see that. I don't know, I can't figure any of that stuff out and I've stopped trying. The movies that I have made, I am very proud of them and love each one of them. What the hell are you looking at me like that for? I don't know. What? I don't know, it's probably nothing. It's nothing at all. In order to achieve the amazing special effects seen in the film, Rob Botton worked seven days a week for over a year. By the film's end, Botton, who was only 22 at the time, was hospitalized for exhaustion, double pneumonia, and a bleeding ulcer. Botton now explains that he would hoard the work for himself, enjoying his craft too much. Quote, I didn't want to take a job and give somebody else the pleasure of making it. It was only the dog creature that Botton afforded to share with fellow special effects creator Stan Winston when Botton realized he was inundated with work. Winston refused to take any credit, however, he insisted that it was Botten's show. Despite this, he is thanked in the credits. The special effects were initially budgeted at only $750,000, however, as production went on, the special effects budget swelled to $1.5 million. Various items were used to create the gore seen on screen from metal, foam latex, and fiberglass, to much more odd things such as KY jelly, strawberry jam, heated bubble gum, mayonnaise, and cream corn. You see, what we're talking about here is an organism that imitates other life forms, and it imitates them perfectly. When this thing attacked our dogs, it tried to digest them, absorb them, and in the process, shape its own cells to imitate them. For the several autopsy scenes in the film, Botten wanted to use real animal organs. However, they decided not to do that when a box of viscera was accidentally forgotten and left unrefrigerated for a week on the Universal soundstage. One of the most famous special effects scenes in which Dr. Cooper loses both his arms could only be achieved with the help of a double amputee stand-in wearing a prosthetic mask and outfitted with false limbs made of gelatin, rubber veins, fake blood, and wax bones. The subsequent scene in which the Norris thing explodes from his chest maul had to be done in one take and took 10 hours of preparation and setup. However, upon recording, Carpenter called cut, arguing the explosion of viscera looked too much like a fountain. The effects team had to set up the scene once more, which took an additional 10 hours, and reworked the prop to be slightly less gratuitous with the gore. The second take is the one that's used in the film. Now how's this mother wake up after thousands of years in the ice? And how can it look like a dog? I don't know how. Because it's different than us, see? Because it's from outer space. What do you want from me? Ask him. The special effects were so involved, much of the script ended up being rewritten to include what the effects team came up with. Most of the script ended up being changed in the end, though both Carpenter and Botten were pleased with the final result. Despite the innumerable script changes, the film took three months to shoot. The interior shots were filmed in an artificially cooled soundstage in Los Angeles. Some of the last scenes to be shot were on location in British Columbia, close to the Alaskan border. 
The final scenes to be shot were those involving the Norwegian base, as the Norwegian base was simply the remains of the American base after the production had blown it up. What can we do? What can we do? Whether we make it or not, we can't let the thing freeze again. Maybe we'll just warm things up while we're around here. John Carpenter has scored most of his own films. However, this was not the case with The Thing. As he simply did not have the time to dedicate to the task, Carpenter delegated it to Ennio Morricone, the renowned soundtrack composer of which he was a fan. Carpenter was such a fan that he used Morricone's own music at his wedding. Morricone did his best to make a simplistic, haunting synthesizer theme, though he composed other orchestral sections. However, Carpenter ended up picking the synthesized theme as it was closest to his own style. Upon hearing the final product, Carpenter seemed awed and relieved. Since the film was not done at this time, Carpenter and collaborator Alan Horth filled the soundtrack with the needed transitions. As a result, much of Morricone's orchestral score for The Thing was left unused until, of all people, Quentin Tarantino needed someone to score his film The Hateful Eight. Given that Morricone was busy with another project, Tarantino suggested that he utilize the unused portions of the orchestral score for The Thing. Morricone accepted and wrote only a small portion of new music for Tarantino's film. You gotta be f***ing kidding. Here's a bonus one. The film's editor, Todd Steve Ramsey, revealed in a documentary about The Thing that he had suggested to Carpenter that they should film a happy ending while they still had Kurt Russell's time. Carpenter agreed, and the alternate ending featured Russell's character, R.J. McCready, being rescued and taking a blood test to prove his humanity, which he passes. This ending has never seen release, nor was it utilized in test screenings, as Carpenter felt the film worked better with its original intended ending. Yeah, you too! That's it for this episode of You Think You Know Movies. Make sure to subscribe, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and get the latest movie and TV news on ScreenCrush.com.